Good afternoon and welcome to the last session of the third edition of Lisbon Law and Tech, the annual event offered by the Knowledge Institute of Fabro de Fogados. We have had the participation of leading international experts from the legal profession, the judiciary, the academia and the business world. Join this discussion and share your thoughts and ideas on social media. Yesterday, we have discussed open justice and data-driven courts with Annabella Pedroso, the Secretary of State for Justice of Portugal, Isabella Ferrari, Federal Judge in Brazil, and Bruno Feigelson, co-founder of Future Law Brazil. Today, we will address global regulation of AI and robotics. AI is the most important driver of the digital transformation happening everywhere. We all know about the huge achievements connected with AI, but we have to also to address its risks. During the last five years, we have seen numerous declarations of ethical principles for AI. However, it is now urgent to try to implement legal rules and institutions so that we minimize risks without stiffing innovation. The European Commission, for instance, has recently proposed new rules and actions to increase trust in AI. And this will definitely be a key topic in the European and global agenda for the next years. Thank you all for joining us. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, you uh, to our guest speakers today. Hugo Pagallo is a professor of jurisprudence at the Torino University, faculty member at the Center for Transnational Legal Studies in London, and vice president of the Italian Association of Legal Informatics. Professor Pagallo is a leading researcher in the field of AI and law, having published the monograph the Laws of Robots in 2013, among more than a dozen books. His latest book is Advanced Introduction to Law and AI, that I recommend very much, uh, co-authored uh, with uh, Woodrow Barfield. He has been a member of various research groups set up by the European Commission, among which the high-level expert group on liability and new technologies. He is currently working with the World Health Organization in the AI for Law Health project. Simon Chesterman uh, is uh, the, the other speaker today. He's a dean and professor of the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law, senior director of AI governance at AI Singapore, and co-president of the Law School's Global League. Professor Chesterman was educated in Melbourne, Beijing, Amsterdam and Oxford, and he is a recognized authority in international law, having taught in Melbourne, Oxford, Southampton, Columbia and Sciences Po. He is the author or editor of more than 20 books, the last of which is We the Robots, Regulating AI and the Limits of Law, published this summer. Also a highly recommended reading. He is also the editor of the Asian Journal of International Law. Hugo and Simon, hi. And uh, we'll begin. Hi, Simon. I think I, you, you are in on mute now, but uh, uh, my, my first question would be for, for Hugo, I, I guess. And... Um, um, I, I look forward to this dialogue. Uh, Hugo, um, you've been working on AI and law for decades. And uh, uh, your, your, your book, as, as I said, your book on laws of robots was published in 2013. Since then, the, the interest in this topic has grown exponentially. Why and uh, uh, what has changed in the past eight years? <clears throat> uh, well, uh, first of all, thanks again uh, for uh, this invitation, and it's a pleasure uh, to see Simon, uh, although not in person. And 
Well, uh, what has happened uh, after, so to speak, after my, my book uh, published eight uh, years ago? Well, I wouldn't uh, pick up a single AI system or robotic application. I would stress the overall trend. <clears throat> In a way, you uh, introduce the question with a very uh, important and technical uh, expression, uh, exponentially. Uh, because, in a way, I think that this is uh, the key. On the one hand, uh, the exponential growth of uh, technology. On the other hand, the exponential growth of attention by scholars uh, uh, dealing with uh, normative issues of uh, technology. Uh, the problem, and, uh, and so this uh, exponential growth uh, has a lot to do with uh, uh, a key ingredient uh, uh, of uh, the analysis, uh, uh, namely the speed uh, of this uh, transformation. And uh, I bet Simon uh, will uh, uh, be more precise th than I can here. Uh, but here we have the first problem that is uh, traditionally uh, all lawmakers uh, had to do with uh, linear issues. Uh, economic growth, uh, uh, the age of the population, and, but at the end of the day, uh, most of them uh, are linear problems. Here we have an exponential issue, uh, which uh, uh, is a game changer. Uh, uh, first, because lawmakers uh, never dealt with uh, this kind of exponential growth at this rate uh, and uh, with this volume. And so it will be very interesting. And uh, I suppose I will discuss about uh, recent initiatives uh, by uh, international lawmakers uh, and so more on this uh, later. But uh, I would think that uh, I would say that this is uh, one of the most uh, uh, urgent issues are raised by uh, the exponential growth of technology. Uh, very well. Simon, uh, um, in, in your book, uh, you describe three main challenges apart from uh, speed that uh, uh, was, was uh, referred by, by Hugo. You refer also autonomy and opacity. Why, why are they key to understanding the, the regulatory issues we, we face now? Well, firstly, let me join Ugo in thanking you for bringing us together and having the opportunity to speak to this uh, very interesting audience. Um, uh, and like Ugo, I think one of the fascinating things is the dilemma for regulators, how to regulate this technology that is changing so quickly. Uh, and so building on the work that Ugo and others have done very much uh, ahead of its time, um, I was trying to think, okay, how should we understand the problem that is confronting regulators? As, as Hugo said, it's unprecedented to have this sort of accelerated transformation in things that are increasingly permeating society. Uh, and I ended up breaking it down to these three ideas of speed, autonomy, and opacity. So speed is just fairly obviously the, 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 the rate at which transactions can be undertaken, uh, the information can be exchanged, in a way that if humans were doing it, say, let's say if you and I were buying and selling stocks, I might sell you something, you might sell it to Hugo, that would take a while. But if it's computer programs, they can do it almost instantly. Uh, and so that produces outcomes like flash crashes where literally a trillion dollars can be wiped off a stock exchange in half an hour. So that, that poses practical challenges to regulation, not necessarily conceptual ones, but practical challenges. How do you regulate things at speed? Secondly, and more kind of confined to artificial intelligence systems is autonomy. This is also fairly clear, I think, that when uh, autonomous systems, when computer systems, when a, a driverless vehicle is taking decisions without additional human input, that does raise questions about whom we should blame if something goes wrong. Uh, and there's a lot of interest, for example, in looking at autonomous vehicles. Uh, and that does pose some challenges uh, but, but not necessarily enormous ones that completely undermine the legal system, um, though there are some issues that arise. So that's the second, autonomy. So because the legal systems around the world tend to be based on the assumption that there are identifiable individuals, either humans, uh, natural persons or corporations, 
uh, that have rights and obligations. And if machines are taking decisions, it might be less obvious which, uh, which individuals are uh, implicated in their rights and obligations. Opacity is probably the newest element that is a real challenge now. And this comes out of the last decade or so of machine learning advances, where increasingly we have these autonomous decision-making systems that are operating at speed, uh, but at a level of complexity that is impossible for humans to understand. Uh, and so, if there are decisions being taken that affect, for example, rights and obligations that we literally cannot understand, that cannot be explained in terms that a human can understand, um, that does pose real issues for a regulator that wants, as you said at the outset, to be able to get all the benefits of artificial intelligence uh, while mitigating the risks. Uh, and so th those are the lenses through which I tend to view the problem. Uh, although there are, of course, many other ways of looking at it, but I've at least found them helpful in trying to break down some of the challenges that AI poses to regulatory systems. Thank you, Simon. Um, a question for, for both of you. Um, uh, you mentioned um, autonomous vehicles and, uh, and also uh, one of the principles that arises uh, when we, we talk about AI is accountability. And... Uh, uh, who is responsible, who is civilly uh, liable for, for uh, um, accidents and, and uh, damages when uh, AI is, is, is implicated, uh, both in autonomous vehicles or other instances? Um, do you think that uh, the, the current rules and traditional rules on, on civil liability, product liability and, uh, and others, are, are um, uh, sufficient uh, or should we reshape the, the, the rules for civil liability? Uh, well, I'll take a quick stab at it, but Hugo has thought about this a lot as well. I mean, it's already the case uh, that um, a, a vehicle might injure someone in different ways. So if I'm driving a vehicle and I negligently crash into you, Luis, uh, then you might be able to sue me. Uh, for the injuries. But if I injure you because the car blows up, uh, it's probably not my fault. It might be the manufacturer's fault. You might better sue the manufacturer. Uh, and so what I think we're likely to see with autonomous vehicles is a shift in responsibility from drivers to manufacturers, from individual liability to product liability. Uh, I don't think that requires an overhaul of our civil liability regimes, but actually I do think changed insurance obligations can play a key role in smoothing that transition. Uh, and, and just while we're talking about autonomy and vehicles, um, that, that transition is actually gonna be quite a challenge because um, the Society of Automotive Engineers has this scale of uh, levels of autonomy that, that some of the participants might've heard of uh, with level zero, no autonomy. Level one, you might have things like cruise control, level two, lane assist. Level three, you might be able to take your hands off the wheel, but you should be ready to grab it at any moment. Level four, you can basically take a nap. And level five, there might not even be a steering wheel. Uh, and what's interesting is that um, the automotive companies have discovered that level three is the most dangerous uh, because we tend not to be very good in that middle situation where we're able to let go, but we're meant to be ready to take control. Uh, and in fact, that appears to have been what happened during uh, the most famous pedestrian accident involving an autonomous vehicle when a woman in Arizona was killed uh, by a vehicle uh, and uh, the, the woman who was notionally the driver um, was watching a streaming video on her phone uh, and it's possible she could be charged with manslaughter uh, for the murder of that woman even though she had no uh, control over the vehicle at the time. In theory, she was responsible. And in that sort of situation, I don't think the civil liability regime is especially complicated myself. The criminal law situation is a bit more complicated, who you might actually want to punish, but that's a separate question. Uh, but, but I know Hugo has been thinking about this for far longer than I have, and doubtless has his own views on this question of civil liability. Hugo, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, well, you mentioned that I was a part of these uh, group of experts uh, set up by the Commission, the European Commission in 2018. And uh, well, just to uh, give you uh, an idea, our report about uh, how to change uh, liability rules uh, in uh, EU law in Europe, generally speaking, 
the report was about 100 pages. So, uh, but just to give you uh, some idea about what we did in the, this report, uh, and partially the Commission has uh, followed with the suit. Uh, for example, if you pay attention to Article 12 of the AI proposal uh, on record keeping, uh, that was one of our suggestions. Uh, uh, why? Because the more we deal with the AI systems, the more uh, the burden of proof uh, under uh, the end user of an AI system uh, uh, can be really heavy. Uh, uh, we have several loopholes in uh, EU law. Uh, to be honest, uh, they uh, uh, don't fully depend on AI. But for example, we don't have any kind of protection for data damages uh, as a general rule. And uh, uh, not to talk about uh, what we dub uh, here in the EU uh, law as the PLD regime, namely the Product Liability Directive, which is from 1985. There were still dinosaurs in a, uh, from a technological viewpoint. So that here we have another big issue. That is, the more we deal with AI, the less we have to do with traditional products the more we have to think about the services. But again, uh, the regulation of uh, smart services uh, either is context dependent, as Simon mentioned, the financial sector, uh, or, uh, well, uh, would need a general framework. But as you know, uh, tortuous liability in Europe is up uh, uh, mostly to uh, up to member states. So there is a, a very fragmented uh, uh, scenario here in Europe. Uh, but in a way, I would agree that uh, here the problem is not to rethink uh, uh, tort law and liability from scratch. Uh, rather, uh, and that that is what uh, we've been doing here in uh, Europe uh, to amend a certain specific uh, uh, aspects uh, of uh, today's law. But, but do you think the trend will be to, to uh, enlarge the scope of application of the, of the product liability uh, regime? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are several... Uh, this is very interesting, uh, uh, namely in uh, 2018, uh, the uh, European Commission set up uh, actually three different uh, uh, groups of experts. So one for the uh, ethical principles of AI, uh, and then now we have this label, the trustworthy AI, this is the EU formula. Then, uh, so to speak, my group of, of experts on liability uh, and uh, new emerging technologies, and finally, a group on how to amend uh, the product liability directive. Uh, this group disappeared. Uh, there has been uh, pressure, uh, to say the least, by big companies uh, that prefer the status quo. And uh, I can tell you, uh, without uh, telling you any secret, uh, that the European Commission relaunched uh, uh, this month, I mean, October 21, uh, the project uh, uh, about uh, starting again how to amend the PLD regime and the like, just to give you uh, another uh, hint, uh, liability of manufacturers of AI as a product are responsible uh, uh, until the product uh, is uh, uh, sold in the market. Then they have no more duties, lest we start discussing about uh, the AI uh, Act proposed by the Commission uh, uh, in April uh, this year. Uh, so really, uh, there are several gaps, in, uh, at, at least in uh, EU law. Uh, I know just a little bit about uh, US law, over there is a completely different uh, story, not to talk about an international framework <laughs> which adds complexity to all uh, this stuff. But to say uh, at least uh, here in uh, Europe, meaning uh, according to uh, current uh, EU law, 
uh, well, there, uh, there are several gaps and uh, it's very uh, telling the fact that uh, the European Commission uh, has started again this month uh, to discuss once again, uh, not whether, but to what extent we have to uh, change this uh, uh, directive. Uh, there are several good reasons, legal reasons, technical reasons uh, why it should be the case. There are uh, several economic uh, uh, interests opposing uh, this uh, change, but sooner or later we're going to have a, a new directive. I, I told you that this directive is from 1985. Uh, how to put it? Uh, the internet was in, in its infancy and there was no World Wide Web. So you can imagine from a technological viewpoint uh, how all, uh, uh, it doesn't help a lot to, to address the new issues of AI. Yeah, of course, of course. Maybe, maybe and, footnote, and... footnote on that, um, just to defend, well, not to defend the EU, but to put it in context, it is kind of extraordinary around the world, many jurisdictions, it is unclear whether product liability rules, rules apply to computer programs. Uh, they pr apply to products and often to electricity, but it's unclear whether computer programs are themselves products. But sorry, Luis, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, my question is, is as, as you know, uh, the European Parliament has, has put forward a, a report with, with uh, proposals also for uh, uh, um, uh, rules on, on civil liability, not product liability, but, but liability for, for AI and, and robotics. And, but but um, the European Commission uh, didn't seem to, to pick them uh, and, and, and propose uh, new rules on that. Do, do you think they, they, uh, the, the Commission will, will uh, work on that direction also or not? And uh, the question is mainly for Hugo because... Well, but actually, we have the first example, uh, namely the AI Act, which is the proposal of the Commission. And uh, uh, here we have, uh, or we're going to have, uh, let's uh, see the final text. Uh, uh, let me only recall you that uh, when the GDPR was first presented, I mean the EU uh, Data Protection Regulation, in 2014, the text uh, well uh, was completely well, very different uh, compared to the final version of the uh, the text uh, uh, from uh, 2016. So, on the one hand, uh, who knows uh, what is going to be the final text of the AI Act? Uh, yet, on the other hand, I think that many uh, parts of that act, for, uh, for example, uh, the set of uh, prohibited users of AI systems are here to stay. Uh, of course, the new set of uh, duties, uh, obligations and the like uh, are restricted to the so-called high-risk AI uh, systems. Uh, but I, I think this is a good example on uh, how the European Commission is uh, uh, taking the challenges of AI seriously with uh, a new set of uh, duties and uh, obligations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and for both of you, uh, my question, my next question is, uh, do you think this uh, AI act, uh, when, when it becomes a, a regulation, uh, will it become a, a benchmark for, for other regions of the world, uh, such as uh, the, the GDPR did with, uh, with privacy and data protection? Um, and, and will it be e uh, really effective? Um, because enforcement, of course, is, is key for, for, for this kind of legislation to, to be useful. What do you think about this? About this? So th let me have a, a quick step. I mean, first, the first thing to point out is, as Hugo said, we don't know what the final act will look like. And there's already a lot of lobbying to, uh, to, to change the text, to reduce some of the restrictions. There's also criticism that it's not strict enough. Um, but I think it will be different from the GDPR because the GDPR has had a major impact, has had a significant impact on government, but a major impact on companies, major impact on global companies. Uh, but if one looks at the, uh, the draft regulation on AI, um, I, I suspect that the impact on companies will also be significant on multinational companies that operate in large 
uh, in large part around the world, the same sort of companies that have um, in some cases just decided that GDPR standards are easiest to implement globally. So they'll do that the way that in other situations they might apply US FDA standards globally. Uh, but when it comes to governments, when it comes to governments using the kind of um, uh, technologies that, as Hugo said, the unacceptable risk technologies that are meant to be prohibited, uh, I don't think the fact that the European Union is prohibiting them is going to stop, for example, China using its social credit system uh, or countries facing or believing that they face threats of terrorism using real-time biometric surveillance. Uh, so I don't think it will have the same sort of um, standard setting effect that the GDPR has on data protection, partly because governments are less susceptible than corporations and partly because data protection, at least as an agreed set of standards uh, for dealing with personal data, whereas in the case of AI, we're talking about a, a loose bag of technologies where the European Union is trying to draw a red line on some particular applications of those technologies, uh, but it's less sort of coherent as a set of standards than data protection uh, is. Hugo, what do you think? <clears throat> uh, well, in a way, you are asking whether we're going to have another Brussels effect, <laughs> yep. this time concerning uh, AI. Uh, uh, how to put it? Uh, there, first, uh, uh, it's going to be very interesting uh, uh, how the final text uh, will look like. Uh, how to put it? Uh, we are waiting for the a new e-privacy uh, regulation <laughs> over the past uh, six years, uh, and uh, still we don't have uh, e-privacy in uh, uh, the, new, the new framework, I mean. So, uh, uh, in any event, uh, it's uh, uh, striking uh, this act, if you consider uh, the problems it uh, it raises. Uh, just to give you an idea, first, uh, there is no mention uh, about the environmental impact uh, of uh, uh, AI, uh, which is bizarre if you consider that, that the same European Commission has dubbed the green and digital transformations of our societies as the twin challenge. So this is, uh, to say the least, uh, strange. Uh, second, we have the typical European uh, problem with uh, small and medium-sized companies. There is a particular article of the proposal considering uh, uh, how to help uh, small and medium companies uh, dealing with uh, the new set of uh, uh, duties, uh, uh, which, of course, uh, uh, bring, uh, brings a lot of uh, problems of uh, money. This is not the first time that, in a way, uh, the uh, EU, either uh, their courts or uh, the lawmakers, are uh, trying to, uh, so to speak, protect us from the uh, big uh, companies from Silicon Valley. And at the end of the day, the final result of the EU efforts is to strengthen, once again, uh, the uh, fat cats in Silicon Valley. Uh, this happened with a uh, well-known uh, uh, ruling of the European Court of Justice on the uh, right to be forgotten uh, 80 years ago, in which uh, Google uh, was uh, uh, considered as a data controller because of uh, its uh, search engines, which legally speaking was uh, really, uh, I would dare to say, more a political decision than uh, a technically legal one. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, by the way, I know that the Google headquarters toasted uh, the, the ruling uh, that uh, very day because uh, uh, they were pretty sure that thanks uh, to the European Court of Justice, they uh, would have no competitors in the search engine market in uh, Europe. It's so expensive to be a search engine after the right to be forgotten uh, ruling. Uh, the risk is that something similar could uh, uh, happen because uh, of uh, the approach of the AI. 
And again, the fact that if I recall properly Article 54 is devoted to how to take all the, the specific case of uh, medium and uh, or small companies working in AI. Well, it tells a lot. I could go on and uh, on with uh, several problems uh, raised by uh, this uh, proposal. Uh, if we want to see the sunniest side of the proposal, uh, within the limits uh, properly stressed by uh, Simon, uh, well, I think that uh, several bans uh, are here to stay, and that's a good thing. For example, uh, limits concerning real-time uh, uh, facial recognition systems in public spaces, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so far, so good, but here again, we have a problem. That is, uh, okay, you are prohibiting certain users, uh, but not uh, the technological development of the technology, because uh, I have a couple of projects, uh, 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 European projects uh, with uh, uh, Europol units. And uh, so it's so difficult. And as you know, European uh, Union has no competence on uh, uh, issues of uh, public security, uh, national security, public order, and the like. So it's going to be very interesting how to draw the line between uh, what's planned to be banned uh, and the use of the same technology. And that, that's another reason why I agree with uh, Simon, that is uh, this uh, uh, double focus uh, on uh, private companies and uh, uh, use of the same technologies uh, for sovereign, uh, sovereignty purposes. Well, that adds complexity to the ad. Yeah, thank you, uh, Hugo. And uh, that leads me to, to a question on, on the race on, uh, on AI. Because uh, on one hand, uh, this new act uh, will uh, put a burden um, into companies. It will be uh, expensive, especially for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. And uh, uh, on, on the other hand, um, the European approach is uh, human-centric and also it, it, uh, it limits uh, uh, somehow the development of the technologies because of the, of, of the, the, the limits uh, posed by, by this uh, human rights approach. So um, how do you relate this regulatory approach, this European approach, with uh, um, the US and, and, Ch and Chinese uh, uh, approaches, which are one um, mo much more entrepreneurial approach and the other one state driven, and, but without so much limits on, on, on the development and, and, uh, and um, enforcement of these uh, technologies. So, so is, is European Union going to definitely lose this race? Simon, what, what, what's your view? It's too early, too early to say, of course, but I mean, one, one important point that Hugo made is that the EU draft regulation doesn't prohibit the development of the technology, but paraphrasing what he said, it does prevent you making money out of some of it. Uh, and so I think that will skew incentives in a particular direction. And maybe that's an investment worth making. Maybe that's a cost worth paying, um, but it's certainly already the case that, that the majority of AI development, if one measures it in patents filed, in articles published, I mean, China overtook the United States in both those metrics, but both the US and China are ahead of the European Union. Now, I don't think it's as simple as saying that the European Union has privileged rights over markets, uh, but I think certainly the European regulatory environment has not encouraged um, that kind of aggressive development of AI. So you've got the, the European, if you, might, if you like, kind of rights-based approach. America continues to be uh, largely market-driven. You've got Silicon Valley, as we've been referring to, um, and not even a federal data protection regulation. You've got state-based experiments. You've got uh, city-level experiments where it was San Francisco that decided to ban facial recognition. Uh, and in the mix, you've got this really fascinating case of China, which is now engaging in is now getting more patents and publishing more articles in AI than anyone else. And for a long time, people said that was because, as you kind of intimated, Lewis, that it's the Wild West um, in terms, I'm not sure if I've frozen on your screens. 
uh, but but we can we can hear you uh, though so okay so there's this assumption that china is the wild west in terms of data uh, and for a long time that was true that um, china could have access to vastly more data because of its minimal data protection regime its different attitude towards uh, the, the privacy rights of its citizens We lost you, uh, Simon. I'm afraid that I have no partner to discuss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you. Uh, I think uh, you, um, Simon, is back. Yeah, sorry about that. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. So, can you proceed? Um, so, sorry. If I'm, yep, I will continue. But um, feel free to cut me off if I uh, if I break up. Let you go, um, keep going, and I'll, I'll try and move to somewhere with a better connection. But what we saw this year, and in fact, just uh, next week, China's Personal Information Protection Act will come into force. Um, you have Chinese efforts to rein in some of the technology companies. Uh, now, this is not being done, I would say, out of a, a deep concern for rights, but rather a kind of state sovereignty model. Uh, their, their attitudes towards data is often focused on data localization. So you do have these different models of the, the European rights-based approach, the American market-driven approach, the Chinese, if you like, sovereignty-led approach. Uh, and one question is sort of which, which encourages the economic development associated with AI the most, which encourages getting the most benefits out of AI, and which guards against the risks of AI? Uh, and to me, the European Union clearly is guarding against the risks, and perhaps that's an appropriate gamble to take, uh, but it appears to be probably at the expense of some of the economic development associated with fundamental AI research. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, uh, I, I'd like also you to comment on this, but, but, but maybe you, you want to also um, um, comment the possibility of, of uh, and feasibility of a different approach to regulating AI, because um, um, uh, both uh, uh, Simon and, and Hugo are affiliated with, with institutions that uh, uh, look at law from a global perspective. So uh, Center for Transnational Legal Studies set by Georgetown University in, in London and uh, Law School's Global League, which uh, also Catholic Global School of Law is a part of. Uh, and, um, and they focus on transnational law. So, um, should we uh, head to a uh, global law of AI and uh, do you think it's uh, somehow feasible to, to do this? So it's a question for, for both of you if, if you want to, to comment. Hugo? Uh, uh, if I may, uh, that would be a great idea and uh, a noble and uh, 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 following a Kant uh, and to have uh, this uh, global uh, harmonic uh, AI uh, regulatory framework. Uh, uh, but, you know, I'm from Italy. Uh, this is the land of Machiavelli. And so I love to be realistic uh, when uh, tackling these issues. And what I see is, well, first, uh, we already have uh, and have had over the past five years uh, uh, a test of this kind of, of issue, uh, namely how uh, AI is impacting the laws of war. And over the past four or five years, there is this uh, CCW, certain conventional weapons uh, framework, uh, which is discussing in Switzerland how to amend uh, the laws of war because of the impact of AI. But after uh, five years, uh, we have no concrete results. Just to stress how difficult this uh, uh, idea of uh, global AI uh, is. Uh, so that realistically, what I expect is uh, what's happening. That is uh, uh, regional, macro-regional uh, strategies, uh, the US, uh, China, the European Union, uh, and then maybe after uh, uh, this is the first step, uh, we'll start discussing how to put together in uh, at the international law level these uh, uh, 
national regional uh, strategies. Uh, but if I may, back to uh, the uh, EU approach to AI regulation, uh, let me stress uh, this point because I think it, this is very uh, uh, two points. First one, uh, of course, uh, the uh, proposal of the Commission, the AI Act, uh, looks like a traditional top-down approach. And in fact, uh, dealing with high-risk AI systems, uh, this is a top-down approach. Uh, but uh, don't forget that uh, several parts of the same proposal uh, are not top-down, uh, uh, especially dealing with non-high-risk uh, AI systems. And moreover, the general uh, approach uh, of uh, EU law to uh, regulating technologies is a co-regulation rather than uh, uh, a simple top-down approach. If you have a look at the GDPR, this is a risk co-regulatory approach summed up by Article 5 of the principle of accountability. Namely, first part, uh, there are the six sets of principles to be uh, abided by, but section two, uh, 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 section two determines that's up to data controllers uh, how to organize themselves uh, also from a technological viewpoint uh, in order to abide by the six uh, principles of this first section of that article. Uh, and if you have a look uh, at another proposal, the Data Governance Act uh, from December 2020, again, you have a co-regulatory approach. Uh, so, uh, and this was my first point. So mind, uh, in Europe, we don't have only top-down approaches, uh, especially uh, talking about uh, technological standards. Uh, uh, it would be uh, nonsensical to uh, set up uh, uh, standards in a uh, top-down uh, uh, way. It doesn't work this way. My second point being that, that there, notwithstanding the differences, uh, there are several interesting convergences between, for example, US and EU law. Um, I'm working, you mentioned it before, I'm working uh, with a uh, health organization. Probably I chose uh, the worst years <laughs> to work uh, with the WHO, uh, but I'm happy, uh, of course. And uh, uh, well, it's very telling that if you have a look at how the uh, FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, uh, US law, and the M, uh, EMA, the European Medical Agency, plus the Commission, are tackling uh, issues of underuse of AI in the health sector. Well, uh, uh, you will see that uh, we have. Uh, really similar strategies, both in the US and in EU law. True, for a very specific issue of AI in a very specific, although crucial sector, like uh, health, uh, so that uh, there are not only divergences and huge uh, uh, differences, of course there are, but we shouldn't overlook uh, some interesting uh, convergences. For example, in uh, February, there was uh, this uh, AI white book uh, by uh, the, uh, in the United States. Uh, now I don't recall uh, the Science Association or whatever. And they insisted time again uh, on a proactive approach to the challenges of AI. And uh, this is uh, what's happening in Europe as well. So there are, of course, uh, huge differences, but uh, uh, significant uh, uh, convergences as well. Thank you. Urku? Maybe I'm being a little bit naive, uh, but I'm a bit more optimistic about the possibility of at least some kind of global regulation. Uh, I mean, I agree with Hugo that the general regulation is um, unrealistic and probably undesirable. Um, you don't want sort of a, a consensus regime governing all of technology if it means that the United States and North Korea and China and everyone has to agree. But I think in some narrow areas, international regulation becomes indispensable. And we've proven that we can do this in some circumstances. So you can contrast the ongoing 
sort of dysfunction that is our effort to deal with the climate emergency, like the COP conference going on at the moment, uh, and the frustration there, where having a, a general agreement is going to be extremely difficult because it will cost everyone money and it's just hard to coordinate. But contrast that with the agreement that um, managed to get a ban on chlorofluorocarbons because they were destroying the ozone layer. So when there is a kind of clear harm with a foreseeable time horizon, I think it is possible um, to get global agreement. The challenge is where AI fits in this. Um, another example would be in uh, weapons limitations. So Hugo rightly said that there's been uh, little concrete progress on lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, but I think there is at least the beginnings of a possible consensus on the requirement for meaningful human control. Uh, and again, it might seem strange that countries would limit their abilities to fight wars, to defend themselves, um, but that's exactly what we've done in chemical weapons, biological weapons, and as I argue in my, my recent book, nuclear weapons, that you can actually, with a little bit, of, again, of an optimistic approach, hope that some kind of deal might be done where you could have an, an exchange of technology where the receiving parties make a promise not to utilize that, not to weaponize that technology, which is what we've done with uh, nuclear energy over the last 70 or so years. Uh, now it's a flawed analogy, but at least maybe it's a ray of hope that there might be some possibility of global consensus, at least on limiting the development of AI systems that are uncontrollable or uncontainable uh, and able to exercise lethal force uh, against humans who they are meant to be serving. Simon, uh, and, uh, and if I may uh, yep. add, uh, Simon is right because uh, another uh, good example on uh, global AI law is given by civil aviation uh, and the powers of the International Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, namely, we already have uh, uh, some common rules at the international law level regulating the use of AI in civil aviation. So uh, again, this is not uh, uh, everything or nothing. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that uh, the, uh, a more pragmatic, uh, realistic approach uh, is a context dependency. That is, uh, uh, before thinking about a global AI, well, uh, what's happening is, is in that in specific, fields and i would say important fields uh, we already have a convergence and uh, uh, we can discuss and we should discuss about the uh, huge differences between us china eu etc but at the same time uh, let's not forget uh, some remarkable convergences yeah uh, but Simon, in your book, you, you elaborate a bit on, on a proposal uh, for an institution, a new uh, institutional building around AI. Can, can you tell us about uh, this? So very, very briefly, the idea is um, if you think, as I do, that at least in some applications of AI, there is a need to maintain rules of human control uh, to prevent the development of uncontainable or uncontrollable AI uh, and some measure of transparency, then unless we have at least global coordination, if not global control, global coordination is necessary uh, because uh, otherwise technology increasingly is global. Uh, and so this goes back to your earlier question about the European Union. If the European Union does in fact constrain certain forms of innovation, uh, that won't constrain it elsewhere. So I think there needs to be some kind of global coordination with a very, very narrow remit for enforcement. And so the model I draw on is the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, which really dates back to the end of the Second World War and a grand bargain that was struck when the dangers of nuclear energy were clearly foreseen because you had the aftermath of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, but also the benefits seem pretty clear. Uh, in terms of the possibilities for nuclear energy, its application in medicine, in agriculture. Uh, and so you had at the heart of the IAEA a grand bargain that the countries with nuclear technology would share that technology for peaceful purposes in exchange for an agreement that those would be the only purposes for which the technology would be deployed. Uh, and the nuclear powers themselves 
um, would, uh, would commit at some unspecified point in the future to disarmament and to not using their nuclear weapons. Now, I say this was idealistic then, uh, but it is kind of amazing that a couple of generations later, uh, people who uh, were active in the 1940s and 50s, I suspect would have been pleasantly shocked to find out that no more nuclear weapons have been used in anger since 1945, and only a handful of countries possess them. So the idea which is fleshed out in the book is a, a comparable international artificial intelligence agency, uh, which would coordinate these standards, these uh, hopefully nudge countries towards uh, these standards that Hugo was talking about, but also explicitly embrace this idea of a bargain that in exchange for the transfer of technology, sharing of information, uh, there would be a commitment by all not to weaponize artificial intelligence, either in the sense of lethal autonomous weapons or the development of general artificial intelligence systems that could ultimately get beyond human control. Uh, so it's partly, it's, it's a semi-serious proposal, but I, I, I can see easy criticism of it. Uh, but I do think if, you're, if you believe that some kind of regulatory coordination is going to be needed, then we need some kind of entity that embraces both the politics and the economics of AI in order to try and uh, pursue those ends. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Simon. Um, if I may, yep. uh, talking about um, uh, agencies, uh, uh, I think that, uh, that this is a great idea and a, a necessary idea. Uh, and uh, this is what we suggested the European Commission, and this is what you find uh, in Article 56 of the AI uh, proposal. At the European level. Uh, and I say necessary for this obvious reason. Uh, and maybe that's the reason why the European Commission followed with suit. We already have, uh, I don't want to say a dozen, but almost a dozen uh, agencies dealing with AI in different fields of the law. So, uh, namely uh, the health sector, the financial sector, civil aviation, uh, data protection. So the risk, uh, the real risk, uh, is to have uh, as many definitions of AI as uh, uh, the agencies you are dealing with. Uh, and in order to prevent uh, this uh, risk, uh, well, uh, it seems natural to have uh, an uh, AI uh, agency, uh, Article 56 refers to the European AI Board, well, uh, just to prevent uh, this problem, because uh, on, uh, on top of uh, what Simon uh, said, uh, we have to prevent uh, also the problem that uh, uh, you may have uh, different uh, definitions of AI uh, according to the agency you're dealing with. And, uh, uh, and this would uh, uh, add complexity and we don't need to add complexity to an already intricate uh, set of issues. Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, Simon, as, as uh, mentioned, uh, the, the possibility of, of um, going to an artificial uh, general intelligence. So uh, the idea of singularity, the, the, that the machines will, will surpass uh, human, human knowledge or capacities. And of course, this is science fiction for now, but uh, uh, should we be thinking uh, in, in this uh, future and uh, um, uh, on the way, should we think of, of granting legal personality to, to robots or to AI systems? Um, so, so this is, as you say, an idea that until a few years ago was really confined to science fiction. And I think it remains science fiction, but at least there is more serious discussion about it. Uh, and I mean, I answer the question by saying, okay, why might you want to give legal personality to AI systems, assuming you could define AI systems adequately? And there are sort of two and a half reasons. Uh, and I, spoiler alert, my answer is no, we should not. But the two and a half reasons are one, um, to blame someone when things go wrong. Uh, and we kind of talked about that earlier in the liability discussion. Um, you could, in theory, attribute personality to every driverless vehicle. That would be possible within a legal system. You can give personality effectively to anything the legal system wants to. 
Um, but I don't think that would do anything more than protect companies from liability. So I don't think you really need to um, give it for reasons that um, you, can, you need to punish someone. Um, the second reason is to reward someone when things go right. Uh, and this is more moving into the area of intellectual property. And there have been really interesting developments here where increasingly AI systems are effectively the inventors of patent, uh, patentable um, technologies. Uh, and so uh, Ryan Abbott, among others, has been um, sort of engaging in litigation around the world. Until recently, the European Union said no, the UK said no, the United States says no. They all said you have to have a human inventor, that sort of spark of invention. Uh, but in Australia and South Africa last August or this August, uh, we had AI systems recognized as inventors only for the purposes of the patent application. They don't actually have any rights. Um, but what you're pointing to is, uh, Luis, the possibility that as AI systems become more like us, maybe they would be more entitled to human to rights, uh, the way a person doesn't need, a human doesn't need to pass a Turing test in order to get rights recognized. Uh, but I think we are a, a long way off that. But if we ever did get go, go in that direction, one of the, the limits in the way in which we think about this is that we tend to think that if AI systems become sentient, they will look like us and act like us, human shaped with human level intelligence. Uh, whereas I suspect, and the, the technologists would know better than I, if we ever get an AI system to truly dog level intelligence, just so, let's say, uh, and then human level, it's not gonna go sort of foolish human than Albert Einstein. It's gonna go way beyond humans very, very quickly. And that, if you like, is the half reason why I think we might want to contemplate giving AI systems legal personality, not so we can blame them when things go wrong, not so we can reward them when things go right, but perhaps so we can involve them as equals in a moral conversation, partly out of self-interest, so that if they ever do surpass us, then hopefully, uh, much as we are treating them as more than things, they will treat us as more than things in return. But at the moment, that's more in the realm of a thought experiment, uh, but a thought experiment that I think over the next couple of decades, we will have to take more seriously. Hugo, what's your view on this? Uh, you, you've written extensively on, on, on this. Uh, how to put it? Uh, when I was uh, in, the, in the group of experts, uh, I was the uh, only scholar uh, who uh, considered uh, that uh, some form of legal agency uh, up to AI systems uh, was not a crazy idea. And if you have a look at the, our report, you will find out a footnote in which uh, I convinced the group that this is an empirical issue. It's not a philosophical issue, mind, uh, without considering sci-fi scenarios. Uh, in other words, uh, my uh, uh, opinion is that we should consider new forms of legal agenthood for our AI systems, although these AI systems uh, are stupid, uh, for practical reasons. Uh, what are these practical reasons? Well, for example, cases of uh, distributed responsibility. Uh, when uh, environmental law is a typical example, if you take uh, one action uh, individually, there's no problem. When you add all uh, the uh, outputs of uh, all the single actions, here we have the problem. Uh, and in cases of distributed responsibility, it's uh, very hard to pick up uh, a single agent and uh, saying, wow, well, you are accountable, you are responsible for the final outcome or given the complexity of the uh, human technological interaction. In uh, many cases, the chains of cause and effects uh, is, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say it will not work any longer, but it's going to be really difficult once again uh, to find uh, someone accountable or responsible for that final output. In addition, I always stress the difference between personhood and agenthood, because they are not the same thing. A typical example is my favorite one, not for ethical reasons. It's a bad example, but very pragmatic. As you know, in ancient Roman law, businessmen were slaves. 
because aristocrats uh, didn't like to do business uh, as before the French Revolution, the same. Uh, uh, so that Romans had our problem two millennia ago. Namely, on the one hand, slaves were considered as things. AI is a thing. On the other hand, however, uh, those things were crucial because all the economic uh, sector revolved around them. So that Romans had to invent uh, something to strike the proper balance uh, between uh, things, uh, humans, and the business as usual. And uh, another typical example uh, of this difference uh, had to do with uh, the European Union before the uh, Maastricht Treaty. The EU didn't have a, a legal uh, personhood. Even President Trump uh, declared that the EU had no legal personhood at the international level. Uh, I didn't understand if he was really uh, uh, joking or thinking uh, seriously what he said. In any event, uh, and you may recall that, uh, maybe I'm uh, just a little bit guilty here, that the European Parliament uh, in February 2017 proposed uh, this idea of uh, an electronic personhood, or whatever, uh, et cetera. Uh, so summing up, uh, I think that general AI is a science fiction and we have uh, other priorities. Uh, on the other hand, I think that even dealing with today's technology, and again, uh, today's AI has the intelligence of my fridge, and trust me, my fridge is not intelligent. Uh, however, for empirical, pragmatic reasons, uh, this uh, could be uh, a way to tackle uh, otherwise uh, uh, problems that uh, I, I don't know how we could uh, tackle them properly. A uh, typical example, because of Simon, when, uh, when I proposed uh, this uh, thesis uh, 10 years ago and so, uh, of course, one uh, criticism is, uh, come on, this legal status for AI systems is simple, a shield for uh, the, uh, the big uh, corporations. Uh, 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 yes and no, uh, of course, they could be a shield if you uh, amend uh, the law in uh, a bad way, uh, but they are not necessarily a, a shield for corporations. For example, this is my typical European uh, scenario. Uh, I've been working in self-driving technologies uh, over the past 15 years, because I consider that uh, a world in which every year 30,000 Europeans and 45,000 Americans died because of car accidents, namely because of human stupidity, well, we have to overcome this world and uh, self-driving uh, technologies uh, will help us uh, overcome this tragedy. Uh, so that I can imagine uh, a town like, like Turin that in 20 years uh, will have a public uh, service, uh, service of public transportation with uh, only uh, self-driving uh, cars plus uh, bikes. And in case of accidents, it's gonna be very hard to understand uh, who is liable, who is responsible and uh, the like. And, uh, it could uh, make sense to think to some forms of uh, accountability for this uh, uh, technological uh, system in order to solve a priority otherwise untractable legal issues. But again, this is empirical. Uh, I'm not claiming uh, uh, this is a philosophical stance. Eh? As Kant used to say, uh, uh, there is no a priori argument uh, against uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, the legal personhood for my AI uh, personal assistant. Uh, it's an empirical issue, and if it helps uh, to uh, uh, solve our problems, good. Uh, if not, uh, well, uh, let's uh, find another solution. I'm pragmatic in this case. I, I agree. Um... 
and and it it relates a bit with with this uh, this uh, uh, quote from Pedro Domingos, the the Portuguese researcher who stated that uh, we should not fear AI for being too smart, but rather, as you said, uh, fear of uh, AI for its uh, uh, stupidity, for being too stupid. So the, the problems with AI right now are the limits of the, the technology. Do you agree well, with this? Um, Simon? Yeah, or? You go. Or, or Simon, you... Well, I agree. That, that is, I, uh, I'm afraid of both AI stupidity and human stupidity. The mix uh, could be uh, uh, too much for the survival of this planet. Uh, but again, uh, we have to take into account the uh, limits of current uh, technology. That, that is, uh, um, I think uh, we have uh, to discuss uh, uh, and prioritize uh, what's urgent uh, today rather than uh, sci-fi scenarios. And so for a while, uh, I would say uh, for the next two generations, the problem will be AI stupidity plus human stupidity rather than a general AI. Simon. Yeah, sure. So I, I would say I'm, I am concerned about the, the stupidity of AI systems and the gullibility of humans. Uh, and so two problems that arise, just to add on to what Hugo said, uh, one is that there are many studies that talk about automation bias, uh, which is the idea that if a human is given a prompt or a suggestion from a computer system, uh, our default is often to accept it and to attribute greater uh, uh, knowledge, wisdom, experience, credibility to something that comes out of a computer system than something that's random, uh, whether that's well-founded or not. Uh, and this is linked with the phenomenon I said earlier about the, the autonomous, the semi-autonomous vehicles where you can let go of the wheel, but you're meant to be ready to grab hold at any moment. We're not very good at making those assessments uh, or maintaining that level of attention, but nor are we good at second guessing machines uh, when the machine might be making a recommendation based on impartial information, uh, incomplete information, or potentially biased information. A related problem is that sometimes we do hold the machines to a higher standard than humans. Uh, and so, for example, in the literature on AI, there is, I think quite rightly, a lot of discussion of bias, of algorithmic bias, of biased data sets, and that's, that's very important. Um, but sometimes we interrogate AI systems to a degree that we don't interrogate humans. I mean, as, as Hugo was saying, there are lots of people that die on the road in car crashes. It's actually a million people a year worldwide die in car crashes, mostly because of human error. Um, how often are those in the news? Uh, and you contrast that with the handful of deaths at the hands of autonomous vehicles, every single one of which is in the news. Uh, when an AI system makes a recommendation, uh, we might interrogate it for bias and we know about for example, famous examples of Amazon's resume screening algorithm that was biased against women, um, facial recognition systems that are biased against people with darker skin color. Um, so we can interrogate these AI systems in a, in a way that we cannot interrogate humans uh, because underlying the technology is actually a kind of naive simplicity that if you ask an AI system, are you biased? It will try and tell you the truth usually uh, whereas if you ask a human, are you biased? He or she will almost invariably lie. Yeah, so all of this to say, I think sometimes we, we overestimate the technology, both in terms of its own ability, uh, but also the, the, the credibility and legitimacy, legitimacy that we should invest in it rather than taking some decisions ourselves. So um, we are running out of time and uh, uh, it's, it's time now to, to, to thank our distinguished speakers for, for this excellent discussion. And uh, before closing this uh, final session of uh, Lisbon Law and Tech, I, I would also like to thank the terrific team that has put our conference together. Uh, Elder Galvão especially, Armando Marques Ferreira, Ricardo Henriques, Matilde Mel Cabral, as well as the fantastic communications and uh, IT teams. And uh, I, I would like also to thank our very large audience for attending our conference during these days, the videos. And, and I'd like to 
inform that the videos of the sessions will be uh, posted online uh, in our, our website shortly. So stay tuned for the next initiatives of the Knowledge Institute of Fabrio Advogados and see you in Lisbon Law and Tech 2022.